Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who still, still cannot believe that the Mets traded Daryl Strawberry. He is the captain. Save the neck for me, Clark. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, I am more than excited to be featuring Luau by the green geniuses down at Terrapin Beer Company in Athens, Georgia. This here, Captain, is a true beauty. We have passion fruit, orange, and guava, all paired with big hops and smooth bitterness, garage grade, four out of five bottle caps. And this week, we are drinking cold beer. Thanks to our good friends right here. First up, a cheers to Jordan and Fort Payne. Ouch. Alabama, And a big special shout out to DJ and Abby. Next up, we have Shannon in Huntsville, Alabama. And we also have Phil in Benfleet, Essex, United Kingdom. And a big we like your jib to Patrick D in Los Angeles, California. And last but certainly not least, we want to give a huge, very big, well, I guess it's all the same thing, right? A huge thank you to our friend Anthony Quintessenza. In Bronxville, New York, Anthony and I traded phone calls and emails last summer, and he helped us with the Holly Brannigan case. And I'm very proud to say that while that case still is unsolved, there has been an uptick in stories covering Holly's case on the internet, and we even appeared on the news in Pennsylvania. So a big, big cheers and thank you to longtime friend of the show, Anthony Q in Bronxville. And everybody we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and they donated to this week's beer fund. And for that, we want to thank you. Yes, so thankful for you guys joining us here in the garage. Also joining us on truecrimegarage.com. Sign up on the mailing list. Give us a five-star review. And check out our store page. The items are going fast, so get one today. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Columbus, Georgia. In the latter part of 1977, a series of terrifying crimes started to occur in the Winton District. This is a small, very specific area for these types of extremely violent crimes to be occurring. The area itself was fairly upscale compared to some of the surrounding areas. The sudden outburst and uptick in thefts and violence was highly unusual. Because these crimes remain unsolved, the community was on high alert. The crimes were break-ins, robberies, auto theft, but also a very specific type of crime, sexual assaults and the rapes and murders of six elderly women. The six murder victims ranged from 60 years of age to 89. And the sexual assaults, when the victims were lucky enough to survive the attacks, fit the same victimology. These attacks and murders were occurring in such close proximity to one another and with such rapid succession, the Columbus PD believed that the thief, the rapist, and the killer were one and the same. It was as if something very evil moved into this area, bringing death to town. The attacks, which mostly took place in the middle of the night, shared so many common elements. Almost all of the victims were strangled to death with their stockings. First, a brutal attack with strikes to the head and or chest, and then the application of a stocking 
pulled from the victim's drawer and wrapped two or three times around the neck, twisted and pulled tighter and tighter until the life left their eyes. The murdered victims were all single elderly Caucasian women. Forensic evidence collected at some of the murder scenes told the police the killer they sought was an African-American male. Due to the manner of the strangulations, the perpetrator was dubbed the stalking strangler. The police were having no luck finding this killer of women. Despite an increase in manpower and man hours, despite the heightened awareness and the additional patrolling and the surveillance of Winton, and good old-fashioned detective work just was not working. This serial offender truly was a phantom in the night. The investigation yielded only obstacles and dead ends. But then, in 1978, a possible major break in the case. The police chief received a letter from the chairman of an organization comprised of seven white radical vigilantes. This letter was a handwritten formal introduction to a group that called themselves the Forces of Evil. On September 6, 1977, a nude and lifeless body was discovered near the women's barracks at Fort Benning. This is near Columbus, Georgia. Later, the victim was discovered to be 24-year-old Army Private Karen Hickman. The victim had been beaten with a blunt object and then run over several times with an automobile. Evidence at the scene told investigators that this woman was killed elsewhere and then her body was transported and left at this location. About a month later, an anonymous call led authorities to her missing clothes. Police worked the case and had some leads early on. However, nothing was panning out. This murder at the time was considered to be a one-off. Unfortunately, just 10 days later, the stalking strangler claimed his first victim. And very quickly, the authorities found themselves neck deep and a whole other set of homicide investigations. I do want to take a quick moment here to address the attack on this poor woman. Most reports state that she was beaten and then run over several times, and she was killed elsewhere. And I know there are many great TCG Army armchair detectives out there thinking of the obvious reasons that investigators would come to these conclusions. But I want to include my own theory here, plus a little more insight into the victim's injuries and what was likely not found at the body dump site. There is one rather gruesome report out there that says that the victim was not necessarily run over. I, I mean, I guess she was technically, but a report suggests that that might not be the full intent of the killer. This report states that the evidence showed that the victim was attacked. This is the beating part. She was knocked unconscious and then propped up like in a sitting position against a tree. And then the killer drove the car into her, wedging her between the vehicle and the tree. My guess here is that this report is probably correct. A portion of the body may have been run over when the vehicle was then pulling away from the tree. But I am guessing due to this type of specific injury, and likely the lack of what should have been a lot of blood at the scene, the investigators were able to very quickly discern that the victim had in fact been killed elsewhere and then moved and dumped in this location. I'm curious, though, was there evidence at the location of the missing clothes that determined that she may have been killed at that location? On Friday, March 3rd, 1978, Columbus Police Chief Curtis McClung received a letter. The letter read in part, Dear Sir, 
We are an organization composed of seven members. I'm writing this letter to inform you that we have one of your Columbus women captive. Her name is Gail Jackson. Since the coroner said that the strangler is black, we decided to come here and try to catch him or put more pressure on you. I see now more pressure is needed. At this point, Gail Jackson is still living. If that strangler is not caught by 1 June 1978, you find Gail Jackson's body on Winnington Road. If he is still not caught on 1 September 1978, the victims will double. You have until Sunday for a reply. Don't think we are bluffing. We are called the forces of evil. The letter was written on stationery, embolized with the great seal of the United States. And the paper had United States Army printed in one corner. The handwritten letter claimed to be from a group of seven people calling themselves the forces of evil. As you can see, this letter was in direct response to the information released regarding the stalking strangler of Columbus in the Winton district, more specifically. Right. Police announced that the stalking murders were committed by an African-American offender. And this group, the forces of evil, has spelled out their plans for retaliation in this letter and sent it to police. The group claimed to be made up of seven white men from Chicago. As the Atlantic Constitution put it, the writer coyly suggested to authorities that anyone could come across such stationery and not to assume that he was a serviceman. Surprisingly enough, or maybe not, the writer supplied a return address. However, it was quickly determined that this address was a fake. Again, this (laughs) makes not much sense here, right? We have crimes happening, and now we have this group of vigilantes that are going to come in, and they're going to commit other crimes until the police solve that crime of the strangler. Yeah, but this gives you a little bit of a sense of what was going on in Georgia back in the late 70s. Remember, when we watched Mindhunter and leading up to the Atlanta murder cases, they talked about the, the racial divide at the time in that area. Right. And then on top of that, they were a little bit worried to, there was a lot of rumblings behind the scenes on whether to say that they believed that the offender was white or black in the Atlanta case, because they were worried what effect that would have on the general public. And this case is really just echoes all those fears that everybody had. Right. And this, this is previous. We know we have the coroner who says, Hey, there's evidence. We found evidence at a couple murder scenes of the stalking strangler. And we believe our offender here is an African-American male. This letter claims to be seven white guys that are obviously full of hate and ignorance. And they are going to retaliate by killing African-American women while this other killer, the stalking strangler, is killing Caucasian women. Yeah. And what's their group called again? It's uh, Forces of Douchebags. So the letter writer claims to be the chairman of the Forces of Evil. So while this letter provided a good deal of information, it did not provide any assistance toward the ongoing stalking strangler investigation. This stalking strangler investigation, we're not going to get too much into it because it's a completely different story. Just keep in mind, this was a huge investigation. This was a huge undertaking for the police department. Right. A second letter was received a little more than a week later. This letter, too, contained a fake return address. This letter was a little different, though. It was the same in the sense that this letter, too, would be from the forces of evil and again stated that a woman would be killed if police do not catch the stalking strangler. But this time, the letter included a ransom proposal, $10,000 in return for the victim's safety. This whole Gail Jackson... The, the named victim in the letter, this whole Gail Jackson thing is all sorts of bad, right? So first we have a rapist killer of single old ladies, the stalking strangler who was terrorizing Columbus, Georgia, and now not connected, if you believe the writer of these letters, right? not connected to the strangler. We have a whole nother 
series of murders that are going to occur based off of these threats that are in the letters. So we have what we refer to here in the garage as a double whammy situation. Whammy. Whammy. Well, no, and then on top of that, you have one strangler, but you have these seven forces of evil guys from Chicago. And as former FBI criminal profiler, and I will say this until my dying day, friend of the show, John Douglas put it, this development represented everyone's worst nightmare. A brutal killer stalking Columbus was horrible enough. An organized and murderous vigilante reaction to it could tear the community apart. It's not that far of a stretch to think that possibly this forces of evil is somehow connected with the KKK or white supremacy. And so I think what law enforcement is scared of is not only do we have the strangler, but now we have these white vigilantes killing black women. Is this going to create some kind of race riot? Now, one big problem right from the start with this investigation, they did not have a missing person matching that of Gail Jackson, as stated in the letter. However, what we do have is a woman named Brenda Gail Faison, who seems to have disappeared. The car she was driving was discovered on March 5th, 1978, at the Sand Hill Bar and Grill in Columbus, Georgia. She was last seen on February 27th of that same year, just six days before her abandoned car was found. Her car was found abandoned probably, this probably did not raise a whole lot of red flags. And soon it would be learned that Brenda Gail Faison went by several names, one being Gail Jackson. So now we have our link to the threat in the letter. About a week or so later, another letter was received repeating much of what was stated in the first letter. However, this time they stated that a woman named Irene, no last name given, had been abducted as well and would be executed. A letter received on March 27, 1978 stated that one of Mrs. Jackson's arms would be broken and that there would be a sharp blow to her head that caused death. The author indicated that the authorities would receive a telephone call to detail the location of the body. Meanwhile, the FBI is going to get involved in this case. Keep in mind, by this point, they have already been involved in the stalking strangler investigation. As said in the trailer, the general plan of attack in the stalking case is simple and makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. The break-ins, rapes, and murders are happening in such a confined stretch of land that if they increase manpower and increase hours, you increase the police presence in that immediate area since the offender just keeps returning right. to that same spot. The idea being that you catch him in the act. You catch him red-handed at some point. Once apprehended, you can hold him for the breaking and entering charge for which he was arrested. And then from there any of the forensic material you have collected from the previous sexual assaults and murders, you can compare that to your guy and then charge him accordingly. Well, this is actually very similar to what they did with the Elena child murders where they go, Hey, we know that the perpetrator is returning to, to the scene or using and in, in the Elena child murders, using these bridges to dump the body. So let's stake out, and we'll catch them in the act. Yeah, let's be there. So given the strategy by this point in the investigation, the FBI would still be offering up resources, but pretty much reduced to more of a hands-off role in the stocking strangler case. However, they will be getting involved in the forces of evil case, the hunt for the chairman and his six disciples, right? Yeah. So Robert K. Ressler was in town. And he was having dinner with a friend who is the deputy director of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, GBI for short. This is Tom McGreevy. Side note, El Capitan, uh, McGreevy passed away in 2012. If you need some inspiration, anyone out there, look him up. That's Thomas McGreevy, uh, McGreevy spelled M-C-G-R-E-E-V-Y. Uh, as Ted Theodore Logan would say, he is a most impressive dude. Mm -hmm. 
Ressler says McGreevy asked him to review the letters that were sent along with some voice recordings for some of the phone calls. So some phone calls went to the MP's desk, the military police desk at Fort Benning. Fort Benning is a United States Army post straddling the Alabama-Georgia border next to Columbus, Georgia. Fort Benning supports more than 120,000 active duty military, family members, reserve component soldiers, retirees, and civilian employees on the reg. Wrestler agreed to help. Now, this all came about because of another great man, Judson Ray. Judd Ray was a shift commander for the Columbus Police Department. He suggested to the Columbus Police Chief that we should get the GBI involved. The chief prior to this was reluctant to do so. After Judd convinces the chief, GBI gets involved, and then through the McGreevy wrestler connection, the FBI's elite serial crimes unit gets involved. Another side note, El Capitan, Judson Ray would go on to become FBI and working at the Atlanta field office and eventually at Quantico. Mm -hmm. While in Atlanta, he worked the Atlanta child killer case with Douglas. Judson Ray is, in my opinion, the inspiration or real-life version of the character Jim Barney, Mindhunter Series 2, played by Albert Jones. Right. So Wrestler and Douglas get to work on this case, analyzing the communications from the forces of evil. Wrestler, the senior agent, has the lead on this investigation. Also, you have to wonder if in some cases with this team, if someone may take the lead just based off of their personal life experiences or how they may have, how they may be able to apply to a particular case or the profile of the offender. Yeah. And some people don't like to take the lead in cases and just sit back and give their opinions is a very good possibility here. In this case, this is an example of such wrestler was former military. He was a military police at one time. So this might give him a little more insight into this case or the offender, knowing that Fort Benning is right there. That's where one of the bodies has been found. We have calls going to the military police desk. So given his background, Wrestler might just be the right fit to be the lead on this case. The first letter received contained the seal of the United States and had the U.S. Army printed in one corner. The writer says anyone could have stolen the station area, but right from Jump Street, Ressler and Douglas notice the choice of words in the communications, specifically noting the 1 June 1978 and 1 September 1978. This is more military lingo, as most of us would just say June 1st or September 1st. Next, we have a phone call. This call is going to tell police where to find the body of one of the captives of the forces of evil as the police have failed by this time to apprehend the strangler or to pay the ransom. On March 30th, the Fort Benning military police telephone operators received a call from a man identifying himself as the chairman of the forces of evil. The chairman described where Jackson's body was located, 100 meters from Fort Benning. This led MPs to the discovery of a shallow grave. The body was, in fact, found there that same day. Jackson's entire face and the front portion of her skull were smashed. Portions of her jawbone, teeth, and bone fragments were discovered at the scene. Her left elbow was completely dislocated. According to the medical examiner, the cause of death was multiple blows to the head inflicted by a heavy metal object likely a tire tool or jack handle. Simply put, she died by way of savage beating. Gobble, 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 you filthy animals. Cheers and safe travels on this holiday weekend. 
Today it's like a Hawaiian party here in the garage with our luau beer. So, mm-hmm. yes, everybody out there have a great and very happy and safe and wonderful Thanksgiving. And make sure you spend it with the ones you care about the absolute most. Let's go through the basics of this offender profile or their theories and thoughts as they analyze some of this stuff. We need to keep in mind Robert Ressler and John Douglas of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. It's had so many different names throughout the years. I always stumble when it comes to, to mm-hmm. saying what unit they're in. Um, at the time when they're analyzing the first series of letters, there is no victim yet. They've not found anybody. They've not found any bodies. This is one of those rare situations where we have communication from a soon-to-be offender or someone who has offended, but based off of the information in the letters – is only threatening to kill and they don't actually have a body yet. So some of that stuff that they were able to deduce from those communications, rather interesting here. And again, let's get into this a little more into this offender profile here. So when the chairman described the location of the body, now by this point, we have a phone call that describes the location of where they're going to find the first body. He referenced meters to supply the appropriate distance. Multiple times the chairman referenced vehicles. So what the FBI is working with here, Captain, is the choice of words. The the choosing of using the words meters opposed to feet or yards. Right. Again, this is military lingo. Writing one June and one September instead of June 1st or September 1st. The use of the word vehicle or vehicles rather than automobile, car, or truck. Ressler and Douglas both thought this to be more military than citizen speak. Ressler concluded the following. First, he says there was no group of seven white racist radicals from Chicago seeking retaliation for the stalking murders. He felt that the sole purpose of the letters and the creation of the forces of evil was to steer law enforcement in a completely opposite direction from the actual killer because there was some connection between the killer and the victim or soon to be victims. Jackson was killed before any of the communications. This is wrestlers belief. She was not abducted and then held in wait for the police to catch the strangler. Right. She was already dead and the killer came up with this whole thing post murder simply to cover up the crimes. They believe that both Gail Jackson and Irene were already dead. There was no opportunity to save either one of them, no matter what the letters said. The opposite of seven white guys wrestler believed would be a single black male operating alone. And even though he is referencing the stalking strangler, Wrestler believed that the Strangler and the forces of evil were two completely different killers operating independently of one another. His profile goes on to say that the offender is an enlisted man at Fort Benning. He would be between 25 to 30 years of age. The killer is possibly military police or an artillery man with a rank no more than a E6 rank. We are looking for a man with a modest education and a middle rank. The coroner also concluded that the body of Gail Jackson, as the caller put it, was in fact Brenda Gail Faison. And she was killed about five weeks prior to when they found her. So Wrestler was right. She was killed before any of the forces of evil's letters started to arrive. Yeah, before any of the communication happened. April 4th. Another call led military police to an almost nude headless body. This was found behind a pile of logs at a firing range located on the Fort Benning property. This woman too was beaten to death. This is just, this is just downright horrible, but she was, she was not decapitated in the usual sense. She was beaten in the face and the head so badly Mm. that the head came off. And a lot of brain tissue was exposed. Skull fragments were found in the area, and there was evidence that the body was dragged from the nearby access road. 
and then concealed behind this pile of logs. This turns out to be the body of Irene Thurkild, the the Irene named in the letters and in the calls. Right. But we had no last name provided in those communications. On Monday, April 3rd, 1978, the body of Irene Thurkild, age 32, was found near a remote Fort Benning rifle range. Authorities quickly learned that Irene was last seen at a local bar on March 13th in the company of an African-American soldier. Columbus PD and the Fort Benning CID put out all known and suspected information when making their rounds questioning and looking for a possible lead in this case. The profile directly led to several eyewitnesses saying on separate occasions, and in one victim's case, more than one location, eyewitnesses placed Gail Jackson and Irene with a soldier. And because he frequented two of the local bars, as did the two ladies, these witnesses could provide a name. The victims were seen either in the company of or leaving the bar with William Henry Hance. Hance joined the Marines after graduating high school in 1971. Then he joined the Army in February of 76. He was assigned to Fort Benning in April of 76. Before that, he was stationed in Indiana. And Hans was recently divorced. His former wife, Wanda, says she divorced him in 1977 because he beat her. At this time, Hans is 26 years old and a specialist grade four with the 197th Infantry Brigade. And one nice thing for law enforcement, when your suspect lives at a U.S. Army post, they're generally pretty easy to find. Yeah. Right? So think about this, Captain. This is all happening very quickly. We have the threat of there being murder victims. Then eventually a call comes in that leads military police to the actual victims. Right. And from that profile and from some of the information learned about the victims, we're able to very easily get a really big lead in this case Mm -hmm. because what that profile provides the investigators when they go out and they start questioning people that may or may not have seen something, they're saying we have reason to believe that the suspect is 26 to 30 years old and is a soldier. That really jogs a lot of memories, especially when you're talking about somebody who's disappeared five weeks before. Right. So this is going to lead them to this 26 year old William Henry Hans. So police round up Mr. Hans and they bring him in for questioning. During this time, the FBI is consulting with uh, psycholinguistics FBI consultant, Dr. Murray Myron. Now I know this is going to sound strange, but I can guarantee that this is not going to be the last time you hear the name of Dr. Murray Myron on the show. Mm -hmm. So anyway. The doctor compares Hans's voice with the recorded calls to the military police desk and states he believes it's a match. Mm-hmm. One of the witnesses told Agent Richard Fox of the United States Army Central Intelligence Division, CID, that Hans was the soldier seen with Irene and stated that the two left Vice Mitchell's tavern together. Tape recordings of the phone calls to the Fort Benning police, which indicated where the bodies could be found, were taken by CID agent Besser to Hans's company commander and first sergeant, who they play these tapes, and he goes, yeah, that's a match. I think that's Hans's voice on those tapes. So that's two of them. Yeah. Then agents Besson and Fox told the commanding officer that they wanted to interview Hans. Hans agreed to be taken to CID headquarters where he was advised of his rights and informed that the interview concerned the murder of Irene Thurkield with whom he was the last person seen. Hans was advised of his fifth and sixth amendment rights and he signed a written waiver waiving those rights. Mm. The interview was conducted from about 1 p.m. until 10.20 p.m. Hans was then interviewed by the FBI and the Columbus police for another hour. During the interviews, Hans admitted 
writing the letters and making the telephone calls for the forces of evil. But he says he was forced to do so by the organization. Mm, Yeah. The, The racist guys. Sounds about right. Yeah. The next morning he was interviewed again. And again, Hans was advised of his rights, which he again waived. It was in this interview when faced with all of the evidence, you know, by this time they have had some time to collect more evidence, make some comparisons, and then present all of that evidence to Hans. This is the handwriting comparisons, voice recordings, and they also found footprints found at the dump sites. He, when looking at all this evidence, goes, all right, I did it. He confesses, providing a signed written statement concerning each murder. Now, two days of interviews is stressful and maybe a bit over the top. Mm -hmm. But CID and the Columbus PD state that throughout the two days of interrogation, and those are their words, they chose to use the word interrogation. Hans was given restroom breaks, food breaks, coffee, cigarettes, and at no time did he request a lawyer or at no time did he ask that the interview be terminated. Okay, right. Now, how much is the military involved in these interrogations? For the most part, I believe they they were the lead on this because Irene Thurkild's body was found on their property, so it right. is a military matter. Well, and I would think that the rules <laughs> you know, don't don't apply as much to them. Yeah, I don't know, but we have his his written statement of waiving those rights. So we know he's he's made aware of his rights and he was told of his rights and he right. chose to just go along with the interview or interrogation however you choose to see it. I went into that on purpose because there are some people that believe that Hans was treated unfairly. I can see I can see that argument. Yeah, there's yeah. this thing called waterboarding. I don't know if you heard of it. But technically, it would have been allowed during this time. I mean, I'm not saying that there's any evidence of them doing that to him. It, it would appear none of, of the, right. a tactic like that was not used. I mean, th- their words are, we gave him restroom breaks, food breaks, coffee, cigarettes. He was he could have he could have asked for a lawyer. He didn't. Pl- plenty of water. Yeah, they they weren't they weren't torturing this guy. Right. I think where people call this into question is the length of time that he is being I don't I don't know if I even want to use the word held because it sounds to me like he had every right to just walk out of there if right. he chose to do so. Well, and this is also where he lives. I mean, they're questioning him on the base which he lives, right? Yeah. And in his confession, Hans he's going to give some detailed information regarding these murders. He stated that Jackson propositioned him at the Sand Hill Bar and Grill. He said the two left and got in his vehicle. They only drove a short distance and pulled over. Wait, so he's claiming that she's a sex worker? Correct. Okay. She began to disrobe, and Hans said he flipped out. He started yelling and screaming at her, and he grabbed her. He said when she attempted to escape, he struck her with a karate chop across the head. She fell across the door, bleeding. Hans then pulled her out of the car, dislocating her elbow in the process. He returned to his car. He got a jack handle from his car. Returning to her, he finds Jackson still breathing. Right. This, he says, surprised him. So he repeatedly struck the helpless victim in the face with this jack handle. The beating was so severe that Gail's entire face was destroyed and bone fragments were scattered about the area. This guy is beyond vicious. Some of her brain tissue was literally beaten from the skull. Mm. The force of the attack was so great, it produced a depression in the ground behind Gail's head. Hans then buried Gail's body in a shallow grave. He dug the grave with an entrenching tool. So anybody that knows military, you know, the little, like, uh, I'm guessing that's one of those, the folding shovels that they put on in the backpacks. Hans also admitted to killing Irene Thurkeld, but alleged that he had lost all sense of control and that his mind flipped. He accepted responsibility for the murder, stating that he had begged God's forgiveness. Okay. Now, in a very big surprise to investigators, 
Hans also admitted to the murder of 24-year-old Army Private Karen Hickman. Remember, we mentioned her at the top of the show. Right. Her body was found September 6, 1977. They had some leads in that, but it was considered to be a one-off at the time. And then when the stocking strangler case took off, they were all wrapped up in that. And her, unfortunately, her murder in that investigation kind of got lost, lost in the right. shuffle. So is it believed that, that that one happened first and then it seems like then he couldn't control him flipping out? He can't control himself flipping out. Um, Right. And, and if you want my humble garage opinion here, I think that this mm-hmm. probably all stemmed with it may have started from his divorce. We talk many times about uh, oh, yeah. the behavior of offenders before and after a series of murders. And one thing that they always point to is that there would be some kind of stressor. Something happened in this individual's life that they took. It, something went from being a fantasy to being a reality. They acted upon their their true thoughts and feelings. Right. And this could be someone who hated women, who just hated women. And he used to beat his wife. We have a divorce. And now these murders start. He's beating these women to death. Right. And well, look. If his wife didn't leave him, she was going to be his first victim. Yeah. So in a sense, this isn't so much. We talk so much about uh, these type of serial offenders. They're most always sexual in nature. This is just pure brutality. Yeah. I mean, like you this said, is just I mean, destro- just- this is looking at someone and in, in destroying them and physically destroying them. Well, like you said, I mean, he's pulling her arm out of the car and dislocating it in the process. I mean, this is. These attacks are vicious, and you should have gave us a warning because I'm going to be thinking about this when I ask, Mom, can you pass the gravy? Well, according to the newspapers for the arrest, as far as the papers are concerned, GBI agent Bruce Pickett and Columbus detective James Jones were credited with the legwork, uh, which led to the apprehension of William Henry Hans. Okay, but question. Maybe you know this. Maybe you don't. Did they get to the bottom of why he came up with this ruse or tried to come up with this ruse to to cover up his crimes? As dumb as it's going to sound, he thought it would work. Hmm. So it was exactly, they're not going to get this straight up from him, but he does say that he made up the forces of evil eventually and okay. that he wrote the letters. And I think what we can do here is truly believe what Robert Ressler thought in his theory. His theory was there's a connection between this killer and the victims. The killer is afraid that somebody's going to make that connection. He's going to be apprehended. Right. So to kind of cut that off at the pass, I'm going to create this whole ruse of the forces of evil are killing African American women. And it's going to be something so totally the opposite of me. Is the forces of evil will be seven white supremacists. Right. From Chicago. From Chicago. Yeah. I wonder what he had against Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a really good question. Why yeah. would you just pick randomly Chicago? So exactly that. He he thought it would work. He thought that it would put them off of his trail. Here's the crazy thing though. It's uh, already well, it's been yeah, pretty I guess, crazy. I guess why why does that phrase even come up? Everything's been crazy. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to get out of my head that about the decapitation. In a way, mm-hmm. he injected himself into the investigation. Hans wasn't somebody that they were considering for any of these murders. At hell, at the time, they didn't. They weren't even aware that there were murders, that there right. were victims, until right. he starts writing letters. He injects himself and is through this profile, through the, the profilers that they come up with this dude. So they link him to this, in a way, you have to wonder, had he never started writing those letters, would they have ever caught up to him? Right. Well, in the first murder, they believe is a one-off, right? And that, but that was somebody that... It's thought that they may have dated at one point or had some type of... Makes sense. Some kind of relation, some kind of friendship. I don't want to use the word relationship because people's minds wander when you say that. I They, mm-hmm. they were acquaintances or had hung out on occasion. Something like that is, is what is believed. Right, but the next two, they believe, were sex workers. 
these would have also been regulars at bars where he was a regular. So Mm -hmm. yes, they, according to him and according to some of the other people, eyewitnesses and such, they were sex workers or believed to be so. But my point being is that the first crime, most people thought this is a one-off. We don't have many leads. Now we're not really looking into it because we have this serial murderer and serial rapist on the loose Mm -hmm. attacking older women that's and, right. And now, so we're not focused on that first case and, and without drawing attention to it, how many times have we seen when there's rumors that somebody is a sex worker that their, their crime just does not get uh, the attention and doesn't, and doesn't get the effort put into solving the case as, as somebody else's case would. Well, and when people live a high-risk lifestyle or what can be uh, viewed as a high-risk lifestyle, it makes it difficult to hone in on a particular suspect right. because, it, because, because the suspect in, pool could be so right. much larger. One, well, look, if you're spending a lot of time at a local bar, whether you're a sex worker or not, you're coming in contact with a lot of people throughout your week. You know what I mean? Like if I, if I come up missing, the suspect's pull is really small. But if you're going to a bar that has a decent amount of regulars, now it's a lot harder to investigate. But like I said, when there's rumors that these women are sex workers, their cases are just not taken as serious. And so if he would have never brought attention to these cases, look, the... <laughs> These investigators are on high alert, and there is a small possibility, even though their profile is saying that this this is this guy is different, this killer is different than the the strangler. Mm-hmm. But there's a possibility that they're connected. There's a small, slim chance. So when he's giving us these leads, saying, "Hey, we got there's this body, and you're going to find it," they they took those cases way more serious because of the letters. It, the letter shot himself in the foot. It, it was the letters that made it possible for them to identify the suspect. Right. So if I'm at a bar and I'm interviewing people that are regulars and say, hey, did you know Gail Jackson? Yeah, uh, right. Describe her and then say she's been missing. We found her dead, but she's been missing for five weeks or so. You might get You might not get any answers. But when you have this profile and you say, oh, you didn't see Gail Jackson with a, a 26 to 30 year old soldier. You know, it's a different line of questioning and it's a different response that it's going to conjure up. I laugh kind of because the effort is made to cover up his crimes by creating this forces of evil. And I kind of believe he may not have been apprehended or at least not identified so quickly. Had he not wrote the letters, right? But to top all of that off, man, he was on orders to be assigned to Korea. This guy's a military man. He was going to be sent to Korea in September of 1978. So not only would he may not have become a suspect so quickly, he had a, he had a plan. There was a way for him to be out of the area, shipped far, far away. Right. And look, (laughs) chances are law enforcement and military get along pretty well. Law enforcement could have said, okay, well, we we have reason to believe that this is our suspect. Military reaches out, questions him at the Korean base. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. They relay that to the police, and now he's off the suspect list. Never caught. I ever. think I think had he been shipped out in September, I don't think they would have ever linked it to him if, right, he, but, if he would have never wrote those letters. But here is this monster. That smashes. Oh, he would have. He would have resumed killing as soon as he came back. Right, right. But here's what's interesting to me. Here, here's this guy that. Well, I mean, just look. He yanks somebody's arm so hard that it dislocates it. You can't stop beating these individuals to the point, like you said, it's not a decapitation. It's just a. It's a smash skull. But still, has something inside him saying this is wrong. There's something inside him that he says he begged God for forgiveness. So let's yeah. go into that. And we're, we're kind of skipping ahead here, but I think this is appropriate because this is kind of where it's leading anyway. 
There are a lot of people, you know, last week we discussed a very controversial case that the, the result was a yeah. death sentence and the appearance now is that an innocent man may have been killed. Not a good man, a horrible man, uh, but one that may have been innocent for the crimes that he was specifically executed for. Yeah, real shit princess. So here is another death penalty case that is, it's not without controversy. There are people that believe that the way that Hans was treated is completely unfair. There are many out there that say he was mentally ill and mentally incompetent to stand trial or at least be executed for the charges. Right. Here, here's a couple problems I have with those thoughts and those feelings. First off, let me just get this out of the way. The death penalty is always a touchy subject for anybody, regardless of what side of the fence you are on. I am firmly straddled right in the middle, but the the issue here is mentally ill and mentally incompetent to the point that he didn't know what he was doing was wrong. He says his own words. I begged God for forgiveness. Also, the thing about being incompetent, I've never believed that when we have clear cut evidence that somebody did something wrong and then they went out of their way to try to cover it up. Right. He obviously knew it was wrong if he's trying to cover it up. And he went to such great lengths and efforts to do so. It was just a bad, dumb idea. Yeah. Didn't work out. There was also some talk of his IQ. There was some statement. There are statements out there that his IQ was 70. And then he was tested again at a later time. And the number was 91. So uh, either he got much smarter uh, at, at some point or the, the first test, one of the tests has to be wrong. They both can't be right. Yeah. He got more smartest, <laughs> more smartest. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not without controversy, but the problem, the problem that I want to keep going back to on Hans's case is he killed three people that has never been in question. That has never been part of the question of, was he wrongfully executed? He absolutely killed these three people. We know that to be fact. And if not more, he is suspected of killing somebody in Indiana. And this may have happened before. This would have had to have happened before he was uh, shipped down to Fort Benning. We're talking about an incredibly dangerous man. He's beating people to death. Yeah. The the tricky thing here uh, in, in response to the people that have bad feelings about his execution or if he was treated fairly, I I can see and empathize with some of those arguments and some points of those arguments, but I think they got this one right, as, meaning that he was guilty. He was found guilty of these three murders. Other people sentenced him to be executed, and they carried out that that penalty. Okay, I'm not clear on something. Is he sentenced? Well, in, okay, by the state of uh, Georgia, or is he? Is this military? <laughs> uh, well. Good to call that into question. I was going to kind of breeze through that and, and gloss over it. But where his case gets a little more complicated is for two of the murders, he was charged in military court, court martialed or whatever they call that. Right. One of the murders, he was charged in our normal court, our civilian court. Did he work for Colonel Jessup? I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. It's a few good men reference. Colonel Jessup. Oh, I actually watched that a week ago. Yeah, you should have got the reference then. The thing here, though, is, Captain, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with hard labor in the military courts, and he was Mm -hmm. sentenced to execution in Georgia. So a bit of a conflict there. Um, It's just really, truly in the sense that two of the bodies were found on the Fort Benning property, so it is their jurisdiction. One of them being, one of the victims being an army private herself. Right. But yeah, that that's how that whole thing went down. Now, he did receive a ton of appeals. One of the appeals, I believe, went all the way to the Supreme Court in Georgia. At no time was any of this overturned. I think he may have, I think something may have got commuted to a life sentence at some point. But basically, I mean, are they just arguing mental illness? Because look, if you are beating somebody to death, there is something wrong with you mentally. 
and but that should not change the punishment. I don't know that that would fall under the classification of true mental illness in right. the sense that he is not to be held accountable for his actions or his crimes. Right. So William Henry Hance was convicted by a jury in the Superior Court of Muskogee County, Georgia. Uh, he was convicted of the murder of Brenda Gale Faison, a.k.a. Gail Jackson, and also convicted of attempt attempted theft by extortion. Because remember, he asked for a ransom. During the guilt phase of the trial, the prosecutor lived up to his promise to portray the crime in vivid detail. After presenting numerous photographs of Gail Jackson's mutilated and largely decomposed body, the prosecutor introduced fragments of her corpse. During closing arguments, he reminded the jury that near the place of the murder were found pieces of jawbone with the teeth attached, fragments of human skull no larger than a dime, individual teeth. And he said, you'll have that with you to take out in evidence. The jury sentenced him to death for the murder under Georgia Code Section 272534.1. And he was sentenced to five years imprisonment for the attempted extortion. Right. April 3rd, 1994. You mean 3 April? 3, 3 April, 1994. William Henry Hance was electrocuted in Jackson, Georgia. A few minutes after 10 p.m., just minutes before they flipped the switch, Hans maintained his innocence in a seven-minute statement. He said in part, why are you executing an innocent man? He asked, why, why, why? The stalking strangler would eventually be caught and apprehended for the murders, but that is another story. You know what I'm thankful for, Captain? For me. That's right. I am thankful that everybody mm -hmm. got together and joined us in the garage this week, and I'm hopeful that everybody comes back and joins us again next week. Yeah, gobble, gobble, gee, you filthy animals. I'm thankful for you. Be kind to one another. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.